Bible. Revelation chapter 19 is where we're going to be at this morning. A few years back in our First John study, we spent a significant amount of time on this promise found in 1 John 5.11. Everybody read with me. What's it say? And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and his life is what? In his son. The believer is promised eternal life. The believer is promised heaven, and it's that promise It's that promise that motivates me, and probably you as well, to serve the Lord, pedal, pedal to the metal until he comes, and he takes us there. Revelation 19 opened with us getting a glimpse, uh, well, just a little peek at paradise and a glimpse at the glory of heaven. Now, Some of you have probably figured out that I love teaching children. You know, before, before, when I was at my home church in San Diego, uh, one of the ministries that I had the privilege to oversee was our children's ministry, so we would have five or six or 700 kids coming through on a weekend. That's a lot of kids, a lot of kids. Um, And then I got demoted and made a senior pastor, so (laughs) had to... Had to hang out with old people all of a sudden, no longer hanging out with the kids. But, but here's something that I enjoy immensely, is teaching kids, because they have such unique insights on the Bible, including, including this topic, this topic of, of heaven. I remember one uh, seven-year-old little girl say to me with great enthusiasm, I can't wait, I can't wait to go to heaven. So I'm impressed with this seven-year-old girl longing, longing for Jesus and longing for heaven. So I said, Caitlin, why can't you wait to go to heaven? And she said, because my little brother won't be there. (laughs) I knew her little brother. I think she was right. And along those same lines, I heard a six-year-old boy praying one day, uh, God, my teachers keep telling us that you love us kids and want us all to be in heaven, but have you met my sister? <laughs> just kids. You just get great insight from kids. A little nine-year-old girl told me, in heaven, you don't have to do homework unless your teacher is there. <laughs> Jesus is our teacher. He's our rabbi. He's going to be teaching us. Oh, that's going to be great. And then another teacher told me that she was talking to her five-year-olds about how a person gets to go to heaven. So she says, if I considered myself a good person, would that get me into heaven? And all the kids shouted what? No, No, they shouted. No. No, see? They shouted no. And she says, if I was kind to animals and gave gifts to all the children and loved my spouse, would that get me into heaven? And again, they answered... No, no. no. If I cleaned the church every day, gave my tithes, and never missed a Sunday service, would that get me into heaven? No, No, was the unanimous answer from all these kids. So the teacher asks, then how can I get to heaven? Little five-year-old boy raises his hand and says, you got to be dead. (laughs) Says, you got to be, says, you got to be dead. Kid has a point, unless we're taken to heaven in the rapture. But here's, here's, here's what I'm saying. Heaven is a free gift, just like salvation for the believer. It's not the default location when a person dies. Some people live under the impression that all you need to do to go to heaven is die. Wide is the gate, broad is the road, and narrow is the path, and small is the gate that leads to eternal life. The vast, vast majority of people you know are not going to make it to heaven. And we need to take that very seriously. Family members, friends, co-workers, we're to share the gospel with everybody that we can now because Jesus is coming for his church. That means that all those people are going to be left behind. And if those people that are left behind do choose somehow to follow Christ, they're going to have to go through all that crazy stuff that we've been studying for the last year in the book of Revelation. The scriptures clearly teach that heaven is a prepared, this is a good time to take some notes. Ready? 
Let me see your pens, pencils. Let me see them. Wave in the air like you just don't care. Good, good, good. Heaven, write this down, please. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people, people who have chosen to surrender the care of their lives to Jesus and live a devoted life of making him their first love. If Jesus is your second love or your third love or your fourth or fifth or tenth love, he's not your love. He says, he says he's your first love or he's not your love at all. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All these things will be added unto you. You know, we're living in a culture. We've been talking about apostasy in the church, and there's a lot of churches that don't teach that anymore. Crazy. It's like, they, you got a Bible, right? It's throughout the Bible. Jesus gives requirements for what it means to say that you're a follower, you're a disciple of his. So seeking him first and his righteousness is our goal. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about this morning is the righteousness, is the righteousness of God that's going to come up in our scriptures. Now, for this morning, we, we're, make, we're, we're going to be in the middle of Revelation 19. And you remember that I took a little break a few months back because we were getting Revelation fatigue from all the cataclysm. It's just hard hearing that much downer stuff that's going to be coming on the planet during that time. And so we just took a little break uh, for a while, and now we're finally in, in Revelation chapter 19, and the immediate context is that Babylon has been destroyed. It's been judged by the righteous judge for its harlotry, its idolatry, its heresy, and history of murdering the saints of God. These people are getting away with nothing. These people that are killing saints all over the world. Where's Peggy? Peggy, persecuted church every Saturday night of prayer, which it would be great to see you all there. Uh, She never, that would be a double negative. She always prays for the persecuted, the persecuted church. Convicts all of us, well, we we were going to just say that. No, we weren't. (laughs) So in chapters, in chapters 6 through 16, the world has experienced the seven seal judgments, followed by the seven trumpet judgments, followed by the seven bowl judgments that have devastated the planet. At least four billion people are dead. Half the population of planet Earth that goes into the tribulation, they're dead in those seven years. These cataclysmic judgments by the Lord are on a God-rejecting world. God's not a big meanie looking for somebody to thump. These people have been given opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent. And they're still choosing to reject God after they have seen all of this stuff. And even though... During the tribulation period, some people, some people will surrender to our wonderful Savior. The the vast majority will not. And those who have not come to Christ, well, let me put it this way. Those who have come to Christ during that period, they are going to be hunted down by the Antichrist's enforcement troops, arrested and killed for their love for Jesus, which is why Chapter 19 opened with all heaven rejoicing that Babylon the great that had received God's vengeance for shedding the blood of the servants of God. You know, all this this stuff that is going on in the world and all this stuff that's going on in our country and in politics that is encouraging people not to follow the statutes of God, they're not getting away with it. They're not getting away with it. So sometimes we get overwhelmed with that. They're not getting away. There's going to be a day where all of that is going to be settled. Now, when we discuss, when we discuss in chapter 19, one of the things that we discussed last week, when we discuss the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper of the Lamb, even though we find them mentioned in the same chapter, we can't forget 
that they are two separate events. Most likely, most likely held in two different locations at two different times. The confusion comes in because the word marriage is included in both these events. Now, to put it in an, in an anthropomorphic illustration, how many of you have ever been to a wedding? Been to a wedding? That's all? The rest of you? Well, don't you have any friends that invite you to weddings? <laughs> Make some friends. You're going to get married, right? Uh, uh, you've been to a wedding. Well, that is usually followed by a reception and a supper separated by a certain amount of time. And as the wedding is usually held in the church, the reception is usually held where? Another location, another location. In the case that we're reading about, the marriage of the Lamb that takes place in heaven prior to the second coming of the Lord and the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place most likely. I'm not going to throw down over this. It's a non-essential. You can, you can believe whatever you want to believe in the non-essentials here. But it, it probably takes place at the beginning of our king's reign in the millennial kingdom, which seems to coincide with what Jesus said to the boys at the Last Supper less than a day before he was crucified. He said this, he said this, this is Luke chapter 22, verses 16 through 18. He says, I will no longer eat of it, talking about the Passover meal there, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until what? What's it say? What's it say? Until the, until the kingdom comes. And the Bible also says that Jesus said this, in Matthew 26, 29, but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So the next time Jesus eats and drinks will be at the coming of the kingdom, and some would say that the marriage supper of the Lamb is what kicks off, what kicks off the millennium and his millennial reign, celebrating and and we will be celebrating with him. We will be reigning with him Amen. as a kingdom of priests, is what he says, alongside Jesus. Now, by the time that we get to uh, Revelation 19.7, and if you have never taken a picture of this uh, chronology, just pull out your phone. It will help you. Um, Church-age saints are in heaven since the rapture of the church some seven years previous. And, and never forget this. The seven-year tribulation period doesn't start, doesn't start at the rapture. When does it start? At the signing of the covenant, which I think will probably be relatively close to that. So they are clothed, they are clothed in white linen described as the righteous acts of the saints as a result of appearing before the Bema Seat. You know what the Bema Seat or Bema Seat is? That's the judgment seat of Christ that we read about in 2 Corinthians 5. We've taught through this many times. It is not the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment is for everybody who has rejected God in their life. The Bema Seat is for every believer, and we will give an account for what we did in the body, what we did with the gifts and the opportunities that God specifically had for each one of his kids. When we return with Christ uh, on, on supernaturally uh, equipped horses, Jesus destroys the Antichrist army at the battle of Armageddon. The rest of the unbelieving earth dwellers are killed, and surviving trib saints enter into the millennial kingdom in their earthly bodies where the Lord of the universe sets up his millennial reign and where we will reign with Jesus overseeing parts and portions of the planet depending once again on the faithfulness, on our faithfulness in this life. Now, people always tell me, well, I just want to be happy to get in there. In Greek, we use a term called duh. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, no, duh, yeah. But if God has gifts and rewards for you based on your behavior and your obedience to him 
as a believer, who are you to say that's not important? If it's important to Jesus, Betty Ann, isn't it important to us? I'm waiting for an uh, mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. It should be, it should be important. Not, we, don't do, we don't serve the Lord to gain His love. Amen. He's already given it to us. We serve the Lord because He has allowed us to choose to love Him, to love Him back. Revelation 19.9, and it says, blessed are those who are called or those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So it appears that this passage clearly has, it has a, a forward look to the future and a, and a separate group of saints because the church, the church, the bride of Christ is the only group of those of the redeemed with resurrected bodies. Remember, we get those at the rapture of the church. Old Testament saints do not receive their resurrected bodies until the beginning of the millennial reign, and it appears that Old Testament saints will be some of those coming as guests to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we read this, Jesus told us this in Matthew 8, verse 11. He says, I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of? Kingdom of heaven. So for now, just remember, just remember that the marriage supper of the Lamb and the marriage supper are two distinct events held in two distinct locations. This question comes up uh, many times unto every man and answer, and I'm encouraging you just at least on Tuesdays, listen to every, to every man and answer, 99.9. It's one of the few times where I'll say, hey, listen to another radio station besides ours. But I've been invited to be a part of this uh, this national, it's, not, it's, an, it's an international show. It goes over, all over the world. And this is one of the questions that comes up a lot, a lot of end time stuff. Last Tuesday when I was on, uh, fortunately, they were asking a bunch of Revelation questions about Revelation 19 and 20, and I've been reading ahead, so I'm, I was prepared for those. But they asked, people asked some really good questions, so this is one thing that gets brought up quite a bit. I better hustle up. Here we go. All right, in your Bibles, chapter 19, let's get through this. We're going to start slow, we're going to camp out on, the, on this first verse that we're going to be going through, and then we're going to pick up speed towards the end. So don't look at your watches and say, Bible boy ever going to finish? Yes, I'm going to finish probably around noon. No, it's not going to be around noon. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Let me get there. There we go. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called what? Faithful and true, and in righteousness, is that underlined in your Bibles? In righteousness, he judges and makes war. What? Jesus makes war? Look at how quiet you all get. My cuddly little Jesus, he makes war. Yes, he makes war. Chapter 6, the Antichrist begins his reign with the deception that he's the good guy. Remember, he comes in riding on a, what color horse? A white horse. But soon shows that his true colors are war, pestilence, plague, famine. And then through the black and the red and the ashen horses, he starts going to town. Don't confuse. Don't confuse the white horse of the four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, with this white horse that we're reading about here, the white horse of Revelation 6, carries the Antichrist. The white horse of Revelation 19 carries Jesus. Jesus Christ. Very good. Taking notes on this? I bet you're going to be asked on these things at some point. Remember, chapter 6 says that, uh, that the rider goes out, the rider on the white horse goes out conquering and to conquer and is making war against someone. Who is that someone? It is those who have rejected his rule on planet Earth, who initially refused to give up their sovereignty, and eventually he will crush them. Another interesting factoid here uh, about this white horse is that Islamic teaching also believes in a Messiah. What do they call him? The Mahdi or the 12th Imam, right? Very good. And some Muslims claim that their Messiah is the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6. The same rider that some would say is obviously the Antichrist. Now notice, notice this. 
Go back to your Bibles there. Notice this. Jesus, Jesus is coming triumphantly. And what is his goal? What, did, what does it say? He comes to what? Make war. Make war. This isn't the meek, frail, almost anemic appearing Jesus that Renaissance painters have indwelt in our minds. Too many people picture the white, emaciated, metrosexual, skinny jean Jesus. If that's your understanding of who Jesus is, guess what? Guess what? Guess what? You got the wrong. You got the wrong. Jesus. When Jesus returns to judge the earth, he ain't wearing no skinny jeans. He ain't wearing no skinny jeans. And we're going to see that. We're going to see that in just a couple of verses when we get to verse 13. Now, did you see the name? What is his name? Faithful and what? Faithful and true. Jesus is the truth. According to what verse? John 14, 6. Exactly. On the way of truth and life. No one comes to the Father except, except through me. And if we're going to be like him, we better, we better stick to what God says is true. If you're giving counsel to anybody, you better give them what the Bible says. Don't give them your experience. Don't give them your thoughts. Don't give them your advice. Give them biblical counsel. What does the Bible say? Never go wrong. Giving them what the Bible says. Better not buy into the lies from people either inside the church or outside the church. Yes, there are liars in the church. Look at the person next to you and say, oh! That way you're not spitting on anybody. Don't exhale on them. Just, oh! oh, my God. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that Jesus is faithful? Even when what? When we are not. And if you want to be like Jesus, be faithful. Faithful to what? Be faithful to what God has called you to do. Do you know what God has called you to do? I hope so. We talked about it earlier. Be faithful to use the spiritual gifting God has given you. Be faithful. Be faithful to forsake sin. When somebody tells me they're a Christian and they've been, they, they become comfortable in their sin, that's a very, very dangerous place for a person to be. We're supposed to be forsaking sin. Now, none of us are going to be sinless, right? Not until the day that we see Jesus face to face, because we're still going to have our carnal nature that's constantly at war with the Spirit. But as we grow, as we mature in our relationship with the Lord, we may not be sinless, but we should sin less, Amen. and a lot less, and a lot less, and a lot less. Romans uh, 6.14, it says that sin shall not have dominion over you. And if you are allowing sin to have dominion over you, that's, like I said, it's a very dangerous place to be. So let some brothers or some sisters come alongside you and help you get out of that trap. None of us have arrived. We've all been tempted, right? We all go through stuff. We go through, but, but don't stay there. Don't get comfortable. Don't get comfortable there. Forsake sin. Be faithful in fervent love towards one another. Be faithful in sharing the good news with everyone you can. Faithful to not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Oh, I don't understand why it is optional for the person who says that they love God to not want to be around God's people as much as they can. Please don't tell me that you love God if you don't love being around God's people. Amen. But I've, I've met people. It just doesn't make any sense. That's why we encourage you. Take the 2% challenge. Sundays and Wednesdays. It's three hours out of your week. Three measly hours out of 168 hours in your week. Oh, I just can't do it. I just can't. Yes, you can. You just have to prioritize to do it. But once you do it, oh my goodness, we had... We had almost 70 people here 
last Wednesday night. Yeah. On a Wednesday night. Yes. That's a lot of, the, the, we live in a, whoa, caffeine just kicked in, right? <laughs> wow. That's a good bean right there, huh? We, those of you that have been in the city for a while, that no, nobody has 70, 70 I mean, and that, that that's, doesn't seem like much to me, but nobody has 70 people coming to a Wednesday night service to study the Bible and to be in fellowship and to worship the Lord. So I'm just going to, if you don't like hearing that, who said it? I always said, too baddy waddy. But, uh, but it, it, then, there's, then I just exhort you, there's a, you need a heart check before the Lord. There's something, there's something missing. And you don't want to get legalistic about it. Sometimes you can't make it. It's no big deal. Nobody's taking, taking you know, copious notes. We're not doing a little checkbox, who's here and who's not. I'm just saying, for your own spiritual growth, you should want to be. What, my church in San Diego... We had something going on every night, and I was at church like four nights a week because I just couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough of God's Word. I couldn't get enough of worshiping the Lord, and I, and I couldn't get enough of God's people. Don't you love? I mean, once you become a Christian, you just fall in love with people, even unsaved people. I love all people, but I really love you guys. You guys are my favorites. <laughs> And those people that are watching from home this morning or listening on the radio station today, today. And you don't want to get legalistic about it, but I just ask you, here's, here's the test. You ask the Lord. You ask the Lord, Lord, give me a good reason not to show up here on Wednesday nights. Give me a good reason. And if there's a good reason, praise the Lord. But if there's not a good reason, be obedient and do what God says. Because he says, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So just, just let that click. Don't, don't keep fighting the Lord on that. We need to be faithful to make a stand for Jesus no matter the cost, which leads us to standing for righteousness and making war. When, you are, when you're standing for righteousness, you are also making war with unrighteousness. And all you got to do is turn on the tube. All, I do, all you need to do is take your kid to public school, you're going to find that you are battling unrighteousness everywhere. There is a war on righteousness on us today like never before. We are living in a time, you cops, you know this, we're living in a time when the murder rate in the U.S. is out of control. Why? Because we have lawless, just what Jesus predicted, we have lawless DAs who are not prosecuting people with crimes. Then they get out and they shoot somebody else. What a surprise. We live in an age where the conscience of man is so seared that people are taking selfies with those that they've just murdered. We're living in an age where there is little outcry against the sexual mutilation of children with doctors and even some Churches supporting. It's a heinous act. It is, it's an attack on God. Speaking of attacks on God, the killing of babies inside and outside the womb is rampant and disgraceful to our nation, and it's, it's highly offensive to God. And by that picture, we need to be prayed for little Miss Hannah Montana, right? Oh, my goodness. And the government... The government is so brazen these days, they attack churches passing laws that made it illegal to worship, even in our own buildings. Remember that we didn't shut down. We took two weeks when the president asked us, give us, give us two weeks to slow the spread. Well, when we said, okay, well, obviously it's going to be a lot more two weeks, we're going to meet. You want to throw us in jail? Throw us in jail. We had to go and fight over masks. We had to go and fight over... No, we're going to make a stand. For truth. We're not going to forsake the gathering of the brethren, even if the government tells us not to. They don't have a right. We have inalienable rights. 
And they don't come from any human being. They come from God, and we're going to serve the Lord no matter what. So this unrighteousness and sin is on full display, and God's war is against sin and those who choose sin over him. And this, I, I know this. None of us ask for this fight. Don't we just want to live our lives? We don't want to be influenced by all this crazy stuff that's going on. Just let us live our lives. You want to go do something crazy, something that is completely anti-God? Fine. Don't influence our children. Go do it. You can answer the Lord for it one day. But when you start going after our kids, or you start making something normal that God says is not normal... Christians, Christians, we better, we better make a stand. We better make a stand in this righteous war. Now, we, for some reason, depend on our politicians to make war on righteousness. Well, let me ask you a question. How's that working out? How's that working out? It's hard to tell the difference between an R and an I and a D these days. But it's our fault. We should never. No, the church is to be salt and light. We're the ones that should be influencing culture. We shouldn't be depending on our politicians to do that. That's our job. We should be doing that. You know, there's a large portion of the body of Christ today that is putting way too much trust in politics and politicians. And let me remind you that when Jesus returns, he's not returning on Air Force One. We just read that when Jesus returns, he's going to return on Air Horse One. Air Horse One, right? I thought it was clever. Four of you did too. Yeah, all right. There are some people be- that believe that this potential red wave that may or may not be coming in the upcoming elections is going to turn America around. And the economy is going to go back to normal, and everybody's going to be singing, happy days are what? Here again. Yeah. That isn't true. If you've convinced yourself of that, I've got some oceanfront property and box elder I'd love to sell. Right? (laughs) It isn't true. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. The last president that was in office, he slowed down a few things, a few things, a few evil things going on in our country. But look how that all came back in a vengeance. We can never let our guard down, and we must stay in the fight. There's no such thing as a pacifist Christian, and we better be trained in righteousness to make war against unrighteousness. Who is it that trains us for war? It's God. It's God. Psalm 144.1. Blessed be the God of... Psalm 144.1. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war. 2 Samuel 22, verses 34 and 35. God teaches my hands to make war. Look at the person next to you and say, Christians need to toughen up. Christians need to toughen up and exchange their skinny jeans for tactical BDUs. You know what BDUs are, right? Battle dress uniforms. And Christian parents, look at me if you're a Christian parent. Christian parents, I encourage you, train your children for the spiritual war. Stop putting so much emphasis on worldly things. Well, what college am I going to get into? Well, If Jesus is coming soon, your kid probably won't even make it to college. And that's another topic. Okay. Um, Stay away from the worldly pursuits. Jesus first. Jesus first. Jesus first in everything. He'll work out your kid's vocation. You trying to work something, it may or may not be God's plan. Probably not God's plan if you're putting more emphasis on the things of the world and the things of God with your kid. Train your children in apologetics. What good is it going to be? What good is it going to be for that kid to to inherit the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? 
Well, I got him into a good college. Yeah, that good college is going to steal his relationship with God, most likely, because you haven't trained him to give an answer to every man who asks, the reason for the hope that is within you with gentleness and, and fear. On this topic of making a righteous stand, we just, we just need to be in the fight. Nobody comes and sits in this fight. This topic of making a righteous stand, I hope, I hope, I hope this upcoming uh, marijuana thing is a no-brainer vote for you. I know many of us ex-pot heads, raise your hands, ex-pot heads. I've talked to, well, you bunch of liars. <laughs> ex-pot heads, raise your hands, okay? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Try to leave me dangling up here by the, you're the only one, Pastor Craig. <laughs> I know many of us ex potheads from back in the day realize the negative effects of smoke in the hoochie, right? Oh my goodness, bunch of negative effects. I was, I was chronic way before chronic and 420 became a thing. I was chronic before Snoop Dogg was chronic. <laughs> Older people ask a younger person what that means, okay? All right. We nostalgic baby boomers romanticize about pot not being any big deal because back in the day, we'd smoke pot, and the result is that it made us giggle about everything and, and gave us munchies for Doritos and Hostess Snowballs. Can I get an amen? amen. But the Maui Wowie and the Acapulco Gold and the Panama Red that we smoked back in the day, you know what the THC content was there? You know what the THC content was there? One to two percent. One to two percent. Percent. Today, the average cheap pot, 10 to 15 percent. Sometimes 30 percent THC. And in condensed forms of THC, like in, in hash or, or in oils, all this stuff that they're selling at your little marijuana stores, up to 90 percent THC. Do your own homework. You should know these things. One of the guys that spoke at the conference I was at a couple of weeks ago, a guy named Ed Moses, a drug law enforcement expert for 31 years, told us no one knows what these heavier percentages will do to brain damage, uh, to, to the brain long term. But I'll tell you this, we do have the science on how lower level strains impact the brain. Can anybody say Spicoli? How will it benefit, how will it benefit our state to have tens of thousands of Spicolis running around South Dakota? It won't. It won't. At the training I was invited to uh, a few weeks back uh, in Chamberlain, I was in a group of 50 conservative mover and shaker politicians, physicians, law enforcement personnel, and there were, I think, three other pastors, only three other pastors there from all over the state. Uh, where over this six-hour discussion, we had 15 experts educate us on the plethora of major problems our state will have if we legalize pot. We're going to have higher insurance rates. We're going to have higher taxes. We're going to have higher crime, higher traffic deaths, higher emergency room visits, all because we thought getting high was harmless. It's not harmless. Who cares? Who cares what the liberal politicians claim? Ask any law enforcement officer, and they'll tell you that smoking the Mary Jane is a gateway drug. Well, it's not a gateway drug. Of course it is. I almost said stupid in church. But now I said it. And you know what I was thinking of what I would say to somebody if they tell me that it's not a gateway drug. So I'm not going to say that they're stupid, but it's not a nice word to call somebody stupid. But if <laughs> the stupid fits. What doctor, here, come, come on back. Um, what doctor in their right mind is going to prescribe to a patient to smoke the unfiltered doobies full of carcinogens? knowing that at the very least, it's going to give that person asthma or lung cancer. Has nobody ever thought this through? Doctors are telling you, don't smoke cigarettes that are filtered, but smoke pot. It's just nothing makes 
sense. Right is called wrong and wrong is called right. If THC is the only thing that is going to cure granny's glaucoma, then give her a cannabinol pill. They make it. But I can tell you this, that's not the only thing that's going to cure granny's glaucoma. What doctor in their right mind is going to prescribe a drug that decreases the human immune system, causes brain damage, especially in developing brains up to 20 years old, decreases testosterone? You know, that all plays into the population control stuff. Think it through. And is linked to almost every mass shooter in recent history. Write this down. Marijuana is not medicine. Write it down. So when it comes, when it comes to legalizing pot, just say no. I've been telling people, don't California, my South Dakota. Don't Colorado, my South Dakota. The Bible calls any mind-altering drug pharmakia. Sorcery, that's what the word is. One of the things that he destroyed, Mystery Babylon 4. So we need to make a righteous stand uh, and run these Dr. Feelgoods and Dr. Doobies out of the city and out of the state. But that's only going to happen if righteous people do righteous things. If you stay silent on this and not talk about it to anybody, just have them watch this portion of our message. Sit down and watch this portion of the message and then say, what do you disagree with? What is wrong with that? I just want to smoke pot, man. <laughs> okay. Smoke pot, but don't legalize it. And if I'm on a call, if I'm on a PD call, if I'm, if I'm doing a ride-along with somebody, we're going to bust you <laughs> for pot. For pot. I almost said stick that in your pipe and smoke it, but we can't, <laughs> can't do that. It wasn't in my notes. Hmm. If not... If we don't, we're just going to turn into California. We're just going to turn into Colorado. It's, it, it's happened in every state that they legalize it. So what, let me ask you a question, people. Are you a fighter? Are you going to be a fighter? Yeah. Are you just going to be a pew sitter? Yeah. Okay, well, Sally's going to be a fighter. What about you guys? Are you going to be, are you going to be pew sitters or are you going to be fighters? Yeah. Slightly better. Slightly better. For those of you that said you're going to be a fighter, are you reporting for duty? Are you reporting to, for duty in this righteous war? You know, in our verse-by-verse -verse study through, uh, how much time do I have? I'll make it. In our verse-by-verse uh, -verse study, I'm probably not, but I started late. Remember, I started late. Okay, okay. Great worship this morning, by the way. Uh, in our verse-by-verse -verse study through Judges a couple years back, we were introduced to a guy named Othniel. Do you remember him? Othniel. Othniel, Israel's first, Israel's first judge, first deliverer, and just so happens to be a nephew of Caleb. Do you remember who Caleb was? Yep. Caleb was Joshua's buddy, right? That out of the, all 12 spies that went into the promised land, two came back with a good report. Joshua and, and Caleb. Caleb's a godly guy, godly guy courageously reported back that even though there was opposition, even giants in the land, that with God's help, they would have the victory. Caleb is the dude at 100 years old is still out there fighting giants when he conquers Hebron. So apparently Caleb, the man who is known for holy, the Bible says holy, he wholly followed the Lord. He passed on his heart to his nephew and the ability to make war to those in his family. Parents, are you hearing me? Grandparents, are you hearing me on this? We read this in Judges 3.11. It says, the spirit, right? The spirit of the Lord came upon Othniel and he judged Israel. And then he went to his basement and watched another Seinfeld episode. Is that what it says? <laughs> it's not what it says. He went out to what? He went out to war. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan, that guy, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over the, that guy, Cushan Rishathaim. I always tell people, don't avoid it. Just say it wrong. People aren't going to know. Okay. <laughs> Spirit of the Lord fills this man, 
And the next words are, he went out to war. The reason why men, Christian men, aren't going out to war is because you're not filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit of the living God, men. Take your stand on the wall. Take your stand on the wall. Othniel knew that war was inevitable. So he doesn't avoid the battle. He joins the battle. He doesn't say, well, other people will fight the war. After all, I'm a lover, not a fighter, right? Lover, not a fighter. Well, you better lose the Urkel voice. Man up and get in the fight. Get in the fight. Get in the fight or just ask the Lord to take you home. Because that's the only reason that we're left here, to be salt and light in the earth. Get involved in the righteous war. <laughs> Verse 12. <laughs> I told you it was going to... We're going to go through this very quick. Get a description of our king's appearance in all his glory. Look at this. His eyes were like what? Flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. Many crowns. That's, uh, that, that represents his royalty and his power. And it says he had the name written that no one knew except himself. It's amazing that guys write a whole book on, well, this is what that name is. The Bible says no one knew but himself. Why don't you just leave it at that, Shmo? right? Right? What? We don't have to have answers for everything. Flame of fire. So much for the picture that we have in our minds of, of Jesus meek and mild wearing a bathrobe and Birkenstocks, right? <laughs> and eyes like a cool ocean breeze. <laughs> no, eyes like a flame of fire. And that's the God who we have the audacity at times to say no to. Mm. Mm. It's a similar description that we get in, uh, in Revelation 1, verses 14 through 16, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in all his strength. Jesus is described in all his glory having eyes like a flaming fire. So realize that he's not only the little flannel graph Jesus, but the little lamby on his shoulder, meek and wild. It's more like radical and wild, right? Born to be wild. Remember when we were talking about that? Well, what song do you think that we should close with today? I said, well, born to be wild. That probably... I said, let's just change the words. Let's just change the words to born to be his child. How about that? Yeah. Apparently, worship leaders don't take my advice on that kind of stuff. <laughs> for good reason. For good reason. Look at verse 13. Here it is. Verse 13. He was clothed with a white robe dipped in blood, and his name is called, what does it say? The Word of God. Word of God. Now, when we first read this, we immediately think this represents the blood that he shed to rescue mankind from their sin, which it could be, but it also represents the blood of the godless army he destroys at the battle of Armageddon, as described in Revelation 14, 20, and, and in Isaiah 63. Are you taking some notes on this? Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 4. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save? How about that for a... Worship song. Think we could come up with something with those lyrics? That'd be great. It's already there, right? Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads the winepress? And here's what Jesus says. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of of my redeemed has come. Never forget that the judgments we have seen in the book of Revelation are the wrath of the, the wrath of the Lamb. Wrath of the Lamb. Jesus came at his first coming as what? 
sacrificial lamb. Coming at his second coming as what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Exactly. It's not going to be a pretty sight. It's not going to be a pretty sight at all. Now, notice the second half of verse 13 says that his name is called the Word of God, which reminds us what uh, the Apostle John opens up his gospel with what? In the beginning was a word. He was with God. Yes, the word was God, was with God. It just, it amazes me that people forget about that. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and, grace and, grace and truth. Before Jesus took on his physical nature in eternity past, he has always been the what? Eternal word of God. I often ask Christians if they passionately love Jesus, and they, they just, oh, of course, of course, I love, I love, I love, I love Jesus. That's just the guys. Um, <laughs> now, they say, of course, they say, of course. And then I ask them if they passionately love the Word of God. And they say, well, not so much. Here's my point. Jesus is the Word of God. So to say that you passionately love Jesus but don't passionately love the Word of God is incompatible because Jesus is what? He is, right? He is the Word. He is the Word of God. This is the primary reason I encourage you to constantly be reading and memorizing the Word of God because as you do, you're getting to know God's character, His plan, and His love for you. And the natural response of getting to know Jesus better is what? I'm falling more deeply in love. With the Lord. And the more I fall in love with them, the more I want. The more I want to please them. Look at verse 14. And the armies and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow Jesus on white horses. Now, who's this army? Who, that's right, it does. Remember, the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Who are the saints? All those who have bent their knee to Jesus. So this is, this is the church who has been in heaven for the last seven plus years. Look at the person next to you and say, I'm a saint, not an eight. I'm a saint, not an eight. Now, Jude, Jude, he mentions this in his short epistle in verse 14. He says that the Lord will return with 10,000s and 10,000s of his saints. He's talking about a return, a second coming of God at, uh, uh, and leading to the battle of, the, uh, battle of Armageddon. We're going to get to that next week. Now, now, those of us, those of us who have experience on horseback, this is going to be easy. <laughs> Shake your heads at me because you think I'm a city boy that I've never been on a horse. I have proof that I've been on a horse. Give me your break. <laughs> Lord, why am I always dealing with skeptics? Verse 15, got a couple more to go through before we wrap up for this morning. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. Now, this is where Christians who are taught the entirety of the Bible are able to put the prophetic pieces of the puzzle together And we get that when we read. Remember when we did our 2 Thessalonians study just a little while, just a little while back, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. And it says, then the lawless one, then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Isn't it easier when you know the entirety of your scriptures to be able to put these pieces of the puzzle together? Like I mentioned earlier, Jesus is not coming back to preach the good news in his second coming. He's not coming back to have a, let's just sit down and have a dialogue about this. Let's have a dialogue about the, what the Word of God says. No, why don't we just do what the Word of God says? Don't need a dialogue about it. Let's have a discussion. Let's have a little tea party. No, Jesus isn't coming back for a tea party. He isn't coming back 
to take any prisoners. He is judging those who have chosen to be prisoners of their sin. Last verse for this morning, verse 16. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In addition to his name, the word of God being written on his robe, there is also written these words, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This title represents his desire for supremacy in the life of his followers and that he alone, he alone can be numero uno in one's life, which reminds me, uh, just an old saying, remember hearing this years ago, there is no room on the throne for anybody but Jesus, but there's plenty of room in his lap. Plenty of room in his lap. That's what I want to close with this morning. Are you in his lap? Are you in his lap this morning? Here's a way to test if you're in his lap or not. Most Christians are fine saying that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, yet when it comes to the way we desire to live our life, if we do not desire for Jesus to be Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. So I'm encouraging you today as a result of knowing this promise, we're coming back with him. We're coming back with him to rule and reign for that thousand years. But to get there, you have to be born again by the Spirit of the living God. You have to admit that you have sinned according to God's standards. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Again, that Greek term, duh. Yeah. You've never met somebody who has never sinned, right? The Bible says all of sin fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Yeah. Is death, and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But God demonstrated his own love towards us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Romans 10 13, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the penalty of your sin. Right now, right now, every human being on the planet, either they're going to allow Jesus to pay the penalty for their sin, as he did on the cross, or we, ourselves, will be responsible for paying that penalty. So I don't want anybody to leave here today without knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Don't want anybody here to leave today with a question mark on your life. And I know that sometimes you can be in other church environments and they soft pedal what it means to have a relationship with the Lord. But I can't do that. I, who am I to edit what God's Word says? So my desire is that nobody I know will be left behind at His coming. I want people, you know, just because people are sitting in a church pew doesn't mean that they know the Lord. So today, I'm just going to ask you to pray a very simple prayer of commitment to Christ. Maybe there's some people, maybe you've been away for, from Christ. Let me just tell you, he's not mad at you. He's not a mad dad. He loves you, but he wants you to be right with him. If you haven't been giving him your first fruits, you're not right with him. Today, let today be the day that I, I'm just going to serve him, better than the metal, until he comes. But maybe today you've been in churches, but you really haven't been born again. He says, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. Whoever desires to save it will lose it, and whoever loses it for my sake will save it. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this study in the book of Revelation and, and here in chapter 19. Thank you that it can be fun. To learn the Bible, but yet it's, a, it's, it's so serious, Lord. I, all these people look like they know you, Lord. <laughs> I don't know. I can't see in their hearts, but you can. So, but by your power and by your mercies that are new every morning, we ask, God, that you, that you would search every aisle here and that you, you, Jesus, would confirm or deny if that person is really a son of the Most High God or a daughter of the Most High God. 
And if you want to make sure, you want to solidify that that is you, just in the privacy of your heart, simple prayer. Pray something like this. Like, just, just put it in your own words if you can. But just between you and the Lord, say something like this. Say, say, God, the light bulb has gone on today. I get it. There's a difference between calling myself a Christian and truly being born again. And this morning, I get it. I have not been following you. I've sinned. I've lied. I've stolen. I've looked at pornography. I've uh, blasphemed by taking your name in vain. I've not honored my mother and my father. I've coveted. I've not put you first in my life. I get it, Lord. And I don't want to live my life with a question mark. So today, God, I, I, I am repenting of my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. That you say that you will separate as far as east is from west. And today, God, I don't have all the answers, but I know this. I'm not going to go another minute without knowing absolutely sure that my name is written in your book. So today, I'm turning from the world. The world is no longer going to have a hold on me. I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to count the cost. I'm going to live for Jesus. And God, I'm asking you to just take me by the hand, be gentle with me as, as I learn a new way to live, to live in a way that is pleasing to you. All for your glory, I pray. Write my name in your Lamb's book of life. In Jesus' name, and, and still with, with heads bowed, nice and closed, it'd just be a privilege for me to be able to be praying for you this week. Also, I'd like to get some some materials into your hands. And so I'm just going to ask you, uh, everybody else, nobody else is looking around. If, if that was you, you just prayed that prayer as a first-time commitment or a recommitment, just look at me. Just, just make eye contact with me. Good for you, brother. Good for you. Okay? Who else? Anybody else over here? Oh, I see you, man. Good for you. Truth will set you free, huh? God is good that way. Anybody else on this side, on this side, this side over here? Here in the center section, anybody? Who else? Who else? Just make eye contact. I just want to be able to pray with you. Yeah, very good. Yeah, good for you. Good for you. Man, you got to lead your home. You need the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. How about over on this side? I love you, man. Good for you. Good for you. Who else? Yeah. So thankful that you're here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Father, thank you for these men and women who, they're just doing business with you. I'm already going to forget, probably, who most of those people were. But you don't. And you honor these steps of faith. So God, pray that you'd shower your blessing on all of them and all of us who just want to stand for righteousness in our lives. Lord, we pray, Maranatha, come quickly. Amen. Amen.